Okay. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce to you Emily Trichu. She's a clinical neuropsychologist with the VA Puget Sound Healthcare Systems Geriatric Research Education Clinical Center, the GREC. She's also an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And she's specialized in neurodegenerative disease and geriatrics throughout her career. Her clinical work and research has been focused on the full continuum of cognitive aging from dementia to super aging into the 90s and beyond. And since joining the VA, she's developed an additional complementary interest in the care of older veterans with PTSD and cognitive concerns. She's currently trans uh, transitioning into the Associate Director for Education and Evaluation at the VA GREC. And she's here to talk to us today about frontline tools um, for assessing delirium, dementia, and depression in older adults. Welcome, Dr. Trichu. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up? Thumbs up. Excellent. Yay. So I've tried to do something tricky here where I am looking at the camera uh, instead of off to the side to see my speaker's notes, but it does mean that my controls are not sort of at the ready here. And that's also why I feel bad asking for questions to be held to the end, but I can't see the chat or QA box if things come up. Um, and, but, but um, Barb is watching that for me a little bit. So if there's something urgent, please let her know if there's some sort of a technical problem. Well, thank you so much for having me back um, to give this talk this year. Um, I'd like to thank the Northwest GWAC, um, as well as HRSA, of course, for funding what I think to be, you know, very biased, I'll admit, a very important series um, when thinking about working with older adults and thinking about dementia and the full spectrum of, of things that we might consider in this area. Let's see, it's been a long day, I bet, for a lot of you, um, and many of you maybe have been in front of Zooms all day, so I hope you've got some energy left. Uh, I do. I had a shot of espresso earlier. The one other thing I realize I do want to say is um, I am doing this from home uh, due to parenting demands um, and other considerations, and so at some point here, um, I could be interrupted by a child getting home from community care or a husband or who knows, even a dog, so apologies in advance, but this is real life um, during a pandemic. And here's my first issue is that my slides don't want to advance. Let's see if that does it. All right, hopefully now you're seeing my disclosure. I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial gain from this. Um, my views and opinions, though, are my own. Uh, they should not be taken as a reflection of the policy of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs or the University of Washington. So uh, the funny thing is, is I had the slide in here and then uh, Barb and I met last week just to check on um, whether the slides, you know, all the technical issues. And what do you know, she had the exact same slide. So if you've seen this slide before and it's, this isn't even the first lecture of the series. But I did want to take a slide, um, and I wanted this in here, to think about how this series is primarily focused on dementia and changes in mentation with aging. Um, but it's really important to remember that even if you are focused on mentation, that really, I would argue, what matters is the very number one um, consideration. If you poll a random group of older adults in your community, the loss of thinking ability with age is at the top of their list of their concerns often. Uh, and taking medication as prescribed uh, is often dependent upon mentation. Uh, mobility, perhaps a little bit less. On the other hand, I have certainly had the um, opportunity to work with veterans who were needing to adjust to new mobility challenges, but also had cognitive limitations that made it harder for them to learn new routines, to um, adapt to their situations. So what matters is at the very top, I'm sure someone did this on purpose, but I would argue that mentation is sort of the foundation of this um, so it's not a triad, what's a four-pronged uh, uh, stool of sorts. So learning objectives for today are that you'll come away from this. Um, I'm sure you'll all already have some experience and, and knowledge in the areas of dementia, delirium, and depression, but that you'll feel more comfortable and confident characterizing the three, especially when it comes to identifying key similarities and differences between these clinical syndromes. 
And then really what's critical for the patients that we work with is the recognition of warning signs and feeling confident and knowing what to do to initiate that diagnostic workup. Finally, we need to be able to utilize the data that's gathered to guide treatment and care planning. And that data um, is not always complete, but to help folks along each step of the way. So clinical relevance here, I mean, I feel like everybody's got to put a slide like this in here, but as you all probably are aware, it's 2021, the oldest baby boomers are turning age 75. By 2029, all the baby boomers are expected or should be at least 65 years old. The numbers of Americans age 65 plus is expected to grow um, to 88 million by 2050. And I am afraid that that number may even be a year or two out of date. Um, and older adults do constitute uh, a very significant percentage of just even outpatient physician office visits. They're a third of all hospital stays and also of all prescriptions. Almost 40% of all emergency medical responses and a little less surprising, about 90% of nursing home residents. So here is a slide um, where I just kind of wanted to give us a sense of where the aging changes are occurring in across the aging spectrum um, from 2010 to 2030 to 2050 in terms of expectations. I don't think I have it. Maybe you can see my cursor, but you can see how there's this bulge here. That's where the baby boomers are. There are some differences um, between males and females. I have another figure here that is perhaps more important. Figure two is the dependency ratios expected in the United States as the shift expected from the census in 2010 to what's been projected for 2050. And you can see in that, that the um, dependency ratio where adults, um, or sorry, where folks are dependent upon others for care is gonna hold pretty steady for the youths of our um, country. However, you can see the increase um, for old age dependency, where the burden for that care is gonna come from is not necessarily being fully anticipated and, and the need for healthcare services is going to increase. Uh, I put this slide in just to focus a little bit on the Northwest um, GWEC region that this um, that is probably composing this audience for Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. Uh, Washington is where I live um, with significant increases in the numbers of persons age 65 and older. We only recently have um, a state plan that's being solidly put together to anticipate the public health effects of dementia in this aging population. So the forefront of my mind, um, and for many people, is how to provide care for this increasing, and I would strongly say changing demographic, making assumptions about what one generation's aging concerns are going to be versus another uh, is perilous. We really have to pay attention to what matters most to people and, and be asking them frequently. So there's always going to be a need for some geriatric specialists, but geriatric specialists certainly aren't going to meet the needs of the population, not by a long shot. Are the needs going to be met by primary care providers? I gotta say, um, they'll be carrying a lot of the load. But with the numbers uh, on their panels, the time limits for encounters, they're not going to meet the need either. Uh, at the VA, and I'm not sure how broad sped this term is, we talk about packed teams, patient-aligned care teams. Uh, it's an interprofessional team, and what the exact makeup it, makeup of it can vary from site to site. But we're talking about the primary care providers, social workers, especially nurses, um, psychologists, uh, nutritionists, pharmacists, you can imagine sort of our broad array of aligned healthcare professions. And really that interprofessional team, that's really where it's at. And I also would like to say that those frontline staff, the, the um, administrative assistants and schedulers, they also are a critical part of the packed team. And in fact, sometimes they're the first people to, to get wind or a sign that there's something that's off for one of our older patients. So by the end of this talk, I hope you agree, agree that, um, that always a healthcare team approach is best. And we're gonna need a paradigm shift so that the disorders of delirium, depression, and dementia 
are a regular part of the workup and diagnostic differential, and that we're not always in the reactive position um, when it's already happening, but rather we're always proactively thinking about uh, prevention and at the very, um, and then the next step, of course, are early identification. Whoops, I'm a little out of order there, sorry. So let's talk mentation. What are the changes in thinking that are uh, common in older age? Uh, this is certainly not an exhaustive uh, coverage, just to let you know. What I often hear in clinic, and I've heard from others that they hear in clinic, are things like this. I can't focus, uh, or you hear from someone I, who's been there with their partner. I don't know why, but she's not interested in her usual activities. Uh, trouble with word finding, right? Low energy. Uh, I've definitely heard more than one uh, spouse say my husband's selective attention is worse than it used to be. He doesn't listen to me at all anymore. Uh, my short term, you know, someone might say my short term memory is shot. Uh, I couldn't find my car in the parking lot. Um, maybe even something that's specific to some of the medical recommendations, like what are you talking about? You didn't tell me to increase my atenolol and stop taking HCTV, HCTZ. So what's my point of pulling, putting all of these up here? From what's been just listed, what do you think? Could it be depression, delirium, dementia? It could be any of those. Is, is, these are very um, important things to pay attention to when people say them, but they are in no way specific to any of these. Before we jump into the three Ds, uh, and especially the cognitive symptoms you might observe, I think it's useful to remind ourselves of what might be considered sort of more typical cognitive aging. You'll notice I'm gonna do my best not to use the word normal because that's very subjective and heterogeneity increases with increasing age. That accounts for uh, many aspects of health, uh, but definitely in cognition as well. So we always wanna consider the individual, but we can say that in general, typical cognitive aging uh, should reflect intact autobiographical memory, recall of well-learned information, procedural memory, how to drive a car, for instance, and emotional processing. These are not expected to change radically, and if they do, they're usually very, um, very much a red flag. What does seem to decline a bit is that ability to encode brand new memories. Um, folks may be a little slower to learn tasks, maybe need a little bit more repetition. That working memory multitasking, it doesn't, it shouldn't be gone, but the ability to juggle like the teenagers do, like six things at once, six streams of information is often not there anymore. I'd like to argue it's balanced out by a bit of knowledge and ability to um, actually uh, appreciate what's actually most important and should be done first. No need to juggle five things at once. Uh, the other area that really seems to inevitably have some declines is processing speed, um, that ability to um, think quite as fast. Here is a, a, an older figure, but a very nice one um, from Park and colleagues in psychology and aging, where they mapped um, different types of thinking abilities across the decades. And you can see that there is a, well, shall I focus on the negative first or the positive? How about I get the negative out of the way first? And that is, you can see that there's a whole bunch of abilities that do seem to have a very slow but steady decline across the lifespan. If I might emphasize, it is all the way across the lifespan, even starting in the 20s for things like processing speed. However, as I mentioned, that is often and typically offset by these other abilities, which increase almost across the entire lifespan. And that's things like world knowledge um, and experience um, and certain types of executive function. The crisscross point here, if you may note, is about in the 50s. And I think that's often the trigger for where a lot of people may become aware a bit of what's been declining and perhaps been increasing. It can often be a time um, somewhere between those 50s and 60s where perhaps people are retiring or making big changes in their life. And there's that possibility that this is then bringing to the forefront um, some of those weaknesses that have been creeping up very slowly. Okay, but not all changes are typical, and that's really what the focus of today is about. Everyone experiences slight cognitive changes during aging. However, there are many 
who experience changes that are um, signals of something going on in the brain. And so this figure here um, was pulled from a colleague, uh, Sue McCurry, who's at the University of Washington. And we always like to think about there being stages to atypical change. And again, I'm focusing mostly on, I'm focusing mostly on dementia here. So a preclinical stage, which is silent, there are no measurable symptoms. I will say though, I feel like some people are very much in tune with themselves and they may feel like they're noticing changes, but it's not really detectable on any sort of measures, at least not anything but the most sensitive measures. And honestly, it's having no functional impact. The next sort of stage would be mild cognitive impairment, which is where people are noticing the changes. Usually it's more than just the person themselves. Maybe even more than one area of thinking is um, becoming um, impacted or have, there's an impact on that. But still, folks are getting by day to day. They're able to take care of what they need to, manage their finances, their travel plans, um, medication management, appointments, driving, things like that. Where we really get concerned is when those functional daily activities do get hit and they start, the, basically the cognitive impairments are enough that no longer can folks keep up. And that's about when we start to consider whether this might be a dementia syndrome, which is a clinical syndrome. I'm really lucky to get to follow uh, Dr. Stephen Fielke, who spoke last week on dementia. So I do have some slides on dementia. I may not um, harp on that or spend quite as much time um, as given that he just spoke. As a reminder though, and or in case you missed last week, dementia is uh, a clinical syndrome. Uh, it does not tell you what the pathology or change in the brain is. It's based on a constellation of symptoms that are able to be observed clinically. At the forefront, it's a decline in some aspect of cognitive function and or behavior. And then it needs to meet these other markers. It does, and I've said this already, it has to be significant. There has to be functional consequences, something that the person did before that they can no longer do as a result of the decline in thinking. It's gotta be chronic. Dementia doesn't get better. Even if someone has a, a good day uh, or, or even a good few days, that's not the overall course of dementia. It has that insidious onset uh, and progress progressive course, even if it's a very slow course. And then oh, always important to remember that it's got to be a loss. This can't be someone who's had attention deficit uh, disorder their whole life, and then on testing, they're having trouble with attention, and they're having trouble with their finances because of those attentional problems. It's got to be a new impairment. Uh, keeping in mind that people often have a new impairment if they have a, a, a stroke, a cerebrovascular accident. However, if the only thing that's happened is a cerebrovascular accident, you would see an abrupt decline, so maybe new impairments, but they should actually show recovery afterward. They may not get all the way back up to baseline, but they're not going to have this progressive negative course, unless of course there's something else going on in the brain, maybe a vascular type dementia. So structural damage, Dr. Thilke, uh, Stephen really uh, focused on that. Neurons are dying. Uh, whether it's due to protein inclusions in those neurons, maybe um, other uh, vascular changes that are disrupting communication among cells or blood flow to the cells causing them to die. At the end of the day though, the damage that occurs is not able to be fixed by the brain and, and thus uh, cognition is disrupted. Okay, I think I was um, talking a little bit, well here, sorry, what dementia is not, let me just focus on that. It's not delirium. We'll, learn, we'll be talking about how that has a more acute onset, attention and concentration problems. It's not depression. So the apathy, distraction, um, maybe seeming like cognitive deficits, but if there's the person gets really good testing and are not present, it's definitely not sensory deficits or communication problems alone. If someone has a stroke and, and develops aphasia, losing language abilities, Maybe they don't recover all of those language abilities, but you have to be really careful that you don't start to think that they have dementia because of their difficulty in responding or, or providing their memory you know, for their personal history, things like that. Uh, it's definitely not normal aging. All right. So what are the main types of dementia? Uh, Stephen went over these. The most common cause of dementia in older adults is Alzheimer's disease. That is the 
pathological change that's happening in the brain. Again, dementia being that clinical syndrome, but the Alzheimer's disease pathology being what's causing the change. The next most common type of dementia in older adults is vascular dementia. And uh, this is pretty cruel, but guess what? A lot of people have both. It is not uncommon that an 80 year old who gets uh, who meets criteria for a dementia syndrome will actually have cerebrovascular changes as well as Alzheimer's pathology in their brain. The next third most common, but definitely less common is Lewy body disease. This too can overlap with the other types. Um, I will put two more on here just because I wish to give them just a quick moment. Parkinson's disease is a cruel disease that affects motor function initially. It does have its own sort of cognitive syndrome with um, slowing of thinking and a few other um, more mild thinking changes. However, Unfortunately, the disease pathology of Parkinson's doesn't just stay restricted to those particular parts of the brain that it starts in. It will spread to other parts of the brain and about 50% of people who are older adults who have Parkinson's disease, especially if they've had it for say 10 years, will develop a dementia syndrome of progressive cognitive loss. There is also frontotemporal dementia. This is not particularly common in older adults. However, if you're working with folks say between the ages of 40 and 60, maybe up to 65, and they are showing a dementia syndrome, especially if there's notable behavior or um, uh, executive function changes, frontotemporal dementia is almost as common as Alzheimer's disease as the cause of dementia in those younger individuals. There are many things that look like dementia. That's why dementia is a diagnosis of exclusion. We really want to make sure that there aren't toxic metabolic causes that are creating the syndrome. And I've listed a few of the um, low-hanging fruit heavy hitters here. Also, folks that have systemic illnesses, especially when they're more in the severe stages, whether it's kidney function, or sorry, I have kidney above because of the metabolic effects, but thinking about uh, cardiovascular disease, um, pulmonary disease, even getting something like an infection can cause um, a cognitive syndrome that could mimic dementia. And then this other category seems like a bit of a grab bag, but I had to put them here because these are also high on the list of things to rule out. And that would be depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep apnea that is untreated, uh, especially if it's severe, high levels of stress, can really look like an early, early sort of a preclinical dementia. And then uh, of course uh, I have on there alcohol and drugs. I think um, keeping in mind that if someone has memory problems, their self-reporting of use, whether it's the amount of use or if they're using or what they're using may actually be impaired. So do watch out for that. Oh, and I should also say the things that are on this list, a lot of them are actually, um, especially when acute or in high concentration are really common causes of delirium. And thinking about, so you may catch, let's say you have someone who looks like they have a dementia syndrome, but you catch that they have a B12 deficiency and you get them on B12 and you get the levels back up to normal. Their cognition may improve slightly, but it may not fully reverse those losses. And you have to think about whether there was something underlying and keep uh, monitoring them over time. So thinking about how these things can often cause delirium, let's shift to delirium. There's so many different names for delirium. It, luckily in the last decade at least, folks have mostly um, agreed to use the same terminology and to just call it delirium. When I was in training, we called it toxic metabolic encephalopathy, which was pretty specific, uh, but didn't necessarily capture the true um, clinical presentation. You also may have heard terms like acute confusional state. If you are particularly interested in delirium, there are some true experts out there. Um, Sharon Inui is a, a Boston-based delirium research guru that I follow um, and has many terrific publications on delirium. The thing to take home when you think about delirium is how it's always an acute medical condition. Typically with that rapid onset, the deficits in attention and concentration, what you see in this that you rarely see in dementia is sort of a waxing and waning mental status, especially rapid changes. 
the infections, medications, polypharmacy included, metabolic abnormalities are all the most common causes. Those mental status changes can actually precede objective signs of illness. So someone may show up um, and have the cognitive changes, but say for instance, um, the, their urinary tract infection, which is causing the delirium, is not yet apparent through other symptoms. And it is definitely um, under-recognized in older adults. It's not, and the problem with this is that it's not insignificant. There is study after study after study uh, that have described the increased mortality and morbidity associated with folks who have delirium, following them anywhere from six to having these increased mortality and morbidity effects up to two years later. It's not dementia. Dementia has that slower onset, slower decline, more subtle fluctuations. It's definitely not rapidly resolving, particularly in older adults, even when the cause is corrected. So I've seen folks who've been hospitalized um, for, say, a UTI that got kind of out of hand and they were delirious. Well, the infection can be cleared, um, it was IV antibiotics, but their mentation is not back to normal yet. And that can be really risky when doing discharge planning, especially if it's not appreciated during discharge planning. You can imagine how if you send someone then back home, especially if they live alone, the likelihood of them developing another delirium is quite high if they are still not fully cleared. Delirium is definitely not normal aging, that is rarely confused. Risk factors for delirium, has someone been hospitalized, or I'm sorry, are they hospitalized? Delirium is known to affect up to 40% of those who are in the hospital. Uh, some great reviews, uh, a review and meta-analysis was done not that long ago where they saw in pooled analysis the following risk factors. Having dementia as one of the highest risk factors for developing delirium illness severity of whatever it is that put them into the hospital, visual impairment, needing to be catheterized, low albumin, and especially the length of hospital stay. None of us wanna stay in the hospital any longer than we have to, uh, but that, that situation can often um, be riskier for development of delirium. Looking specifically at a um, hip fracture hospital sample, it was found in a really good size sample of uh, over 550, 35% developed delirium. In that study, they found that the most prevalent or most important risk factors were increasing age, because this wasn't just an older adult sample. This was across the age range. Of course, hip fractures being a bit more common in aging. Dementia was second in this one, history of delirium, overall health rating. Um, having had a history of I cannot speak this evening, institutionalization, if someone's functionally dependent anyway before they had the hip fracture. Interestingly, the amount of blood transfusion, if there needed to be one, um, as well as low iron. Oh, hemoglobin, sorry, gotta get that right. Uh, so in recognizing delirium, just to throw these back out here, here are some of the key features to look for and listen for. I may not have highlighted yet the fluctuating sleep disturbances. People may be sleeping all day and wide awake and very anxious and agitated at night. So there is this sort of this hyper hyperactive and agitated presentation, but do beware of the hypoactive and sedated presentation. One of the saddest things and, and most challenging things for me as a psychologist was to help someone a spouse who was feeling extreme guilt. Her uh, husband had been diagnosed with early dementia and he was just enough in the stages where he just questioned everything. And it was repetitive questioning and she was feeling very stressed out and they were together all the time. And then over the course of a week or, or over the course of a week, he kind of just chilled out and was like happy to just sit in the easy chair. Um, and that kind of got stronger and stronger, but she was so relieved that she didn't get concerned until one day when she went to rouse him and, and could not, he um, was so sedate. Um, and so she brought him to the emergency room and he had developed um, a delirium based on a UTI. So also watch out for that erratic, um, inappropriate behavior. You know, people will pull out their lines. People may um, sort of become delusional, have hallucinations. They're typically visual hallucinations and perhaps a little paranoid. That makes it harder to get folks in for care. Um, and then I mentioned sort of that somnolence. Okay, so 
I think you can imagine though how some of these symptoms, especially something like being um, somnolent or um, having trouble with sleep and attention and focus might actually uh, be not something you would identify as delirium, especially if you, your loved one already um, was someone who experiences depression. So symptoms of depression are often a combination of psychological and physiological symptoms. So I, I, I'm not gonna read this whole list here. You'll see though how there's this mixture of the psychological and physical symptoms, as well as things like trouble concentrating, um, and we often hear about folks having trouble with focus um, and, and occasionally that mild depression presents as someone thinking they have mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's. Let's see. Oh, and in severe depression, it's less likely that folks will have visual hallucinations and more likely that they'll have auditory hallucinations. But I would argue that I feel like in my in the older adults that I've worked with, that's a little less common unless the depression is really severe, or I should say, unless they have a history of having had depression with um, auditory hallucinations and paranoia. Always keep in mind, depression is definitely not just that bad day, a week or a month. We all have those. Also, um, the uh, it's not grief, uh, losses occur and we go through a period of low mood and anhedonia and things like that. However, um, those should recover eventually. And if they don't, if the grief is prolonged, it is important to think about not only is this a depression, but also could it be a, an indicator of something else? Perhaps some of you have worked with someone with early um, stage dementia who keeps forgetting that they lost someone that mattered to them. And so the, the grief is sort of freshened every time they remember or are reminded of that loss. And thus the, the depression, the grief is prolonged. Depression is not just a natural reaction to medical illness or loss. It's not a cause of dementia. People don't really use this term pseudo dementia anymore. And I'm really glad that they don't. I feel like it, it both doesn't really fully um, give you a good picture of dementia, and it certainly seems to give you a negative connotation with depression. And then the big take home message is uh, depression is not untreatable in older adults. It's not normal aging to get depressed. I'll get back to that in a little bit. So recognizing depression, I mentioned the physical symptoms, they're often nonspecific. So do think about that. If you've got someone who is constantly coming into your clinic with GI problems that don't have a clear source or pain that um, may be real, but somehow their impression of it and perception of it seems magnified and they're not adapting, do consider whether they may be having some mood disorder. Older adults might be less likely than the younger adults that come in to actually just saying I'm depressed or I'm low or hey doc, can you do anything for me? Uh, depression is still stigmatized across all ages and there are numbers of um, generations in which it was even greater stigmatization. I do think that patients might be, are sometimes more willing to endorse mental health symptoms in writing than in person, especially when we have these short encounters uh, with them where you're like, okay, what's your mood? Are you depressed? No? Okay, good. And you move on. Do think about whether there's a questionnaire that you can kind of slide them at some point um, that they could fill out, or maybe even save some of these questions uh, and querying until the end when you've developed, had the chance to develop a little more rapport. Let's see. Also, I do find, even though I'm about to tell you about some little quick and dirty questionnaires, that sometimes just asking open-ended questions is helpful. What one person um, calls depression, another person calls feeling blue, uh, using words like anxiety often don't resonate for people, um, but coming up with the language that works for them, what, what resonates for them can often be so helpful. Okay, so I mentioned a little bit about, um, well, first of all, I think it's really important to remember how prevalent depression is in older adults. As many as 10% of adults over 65 seen in primary care settings do actually meet criteria for clinically significant depression. The depressing part of this is that only about 10% of them actually receive treatment. It's complicated why this might not be happening. It could be they themselves are declining treatment, 
but a lot of studies have indicated that treatment is not offered as frequently. It's important to remember that younger and older adults respond equally well to treatments for depression. And this includes both psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. And often the co-therapy with both is most beneficial. That's been shown in younger and older adult populations. What does have to be considered though with older adults, especially for prescribing or thinking about the modality of treating depression, is there other medical comorbidities? Uh, do they have dementia? Maybe insight-oriented talk therapy is not going to be best then. Uh, do they have a number of other health conditions for which they're taking a lot of medications and thus throwing an SSRI on them may not be the best situation. So it's, it's always very complex when thinking about treatment. Suicide rates, we have to remember, and please, please remember, they are higher in older adults. They are also particularly higher in veterans, in males, and in whites and Native Americans. I work at the VA, and I work in a clinic that's for memory disorders. I mean, you can imagine that this is, a, this is what I see, a lot of what I see, um, the people that I see. Now, there are studies that have uh, shown that the depressive syndrome, especially when it's a first time depressive episode occurring in later life, is a red flag for the earliest stages of dementia. The hows and whys of that are not entirely clear. It's probably multifactorial. In some, it might be their own awareness of changes in thinking. Uh, it also is likely um, partly due to the change in neurotransmitters that occur in almost all causes of dementia. So do treat the depression, never avoid the depression, um, never ignore the depression, but watch people over time. Their mood may become better, but their thinking changes, or there may be thinking changes that emerge. Stolen directly from, oh, that's stolen, with permission from Stephen Fielke. I think he may even have shown this uh, in his talk last week, but I wanted you to have it. You'll have this in your handout, and it kind of highlights the common features between dementia, delirium, and depression, but also trying to kind of um, highlight the hallmarks that are different. So this is always where I'm like, so great. You know these now. It's so easy to tell them apart, right? And unfortunately, it's not easy. And what doesn't help it is the massive overlap in syndromes. So, and I'm just going to throw out some facts here uh, just to, to put away in your, in your minds and to keep there. Rates of depression and dementia can range anywhere up to 86% of cases. Very common. Delirium gets superimposed on dementia so frequently. Um, folks with dementia are particularly prone to developing delirium. And in older hospitalized patients, this one study took a sample and, and looked at in those over 70, what was the co-occurrence, specifically looking at delirium and depression. And you can see those numbers here. The take home message that is really important from that overlap is that that 5% who had both delirium and depression had higher odds at a month of having notable functional decline and nursing home placement or death um, by the 12 month mark. I should probably pay attention to time at this point. All right, I wanna, let's, let's get a case going. I wish we could do this more interactively because um, I usually like to call out to the crowd and have you tell me tidbits of patients that you've seen recently and, and what was most interesting to you. So, but in this case, I'm just gonna give you a case. Uh, we'll call him Joseph, um, a 66 year old male veteran. I gotta give you what I know. He is divorced, it's been two years um, from his second wife and it was a short marriage um, or fairly short marriage, less than five years. He's new to your primary care clinic and he actually is new to the area. He's moved here to be closer to uh, his daughter. He's living independently in an apartment. She comes in with him though. Her concern is he just sits around all day and he forgets what I tell him. He, in terms of pre-morbid his medical history, he, or prior uh, medical history, he has diabetes and hypertension, but they've historically been under good control, both his daughter and he report that. So although we've got this really um, connected, or, or I should say concerned and somewhat connected daughter here, she doesn't actually know his day-to-day -day living that well um, and hasn't been that close to him for, in terms of physical location for quite a while. Um, the wife we could reach out to, but she hasn't been on the scene for two years and they were only married, um, they were married for less than five years. 
when you ask him what's wrong, he says, I'm fine. So here's a little more info. You've got him in the primary care clinic and you check his blood pressure, but his blood pressure is actually really bad and check his glucose and it's really out of range. Um, so those are red flags. The thing I want you to not do and or not put, perpetuate would be, oh my gosh, we better up his blood pressure medication or gosh, you know, he's not on insulin, but maybe he needs to go on insulin. I am guessing that from the things I've told you about, you've heard these red flags and you know not to jump to conclusions uh, and do something uh, essentially with polypharmacy and then just send him home. You know to ask more, right? So you're gonna ask questions like, well, how do we know he's taking his medications and insulins and prescribed? Maybe it's be important to monitor this more. Is there a pill box? Have refills been happening and the timeline they should be? That would be useful information. Uh, when you ask him about how he's adjusting to living here, he focuses on how much he misses his wife from whom he's been divorced for two years and how he doesn't have any friends. The other thing that you as a healthcare provider um, are attuned to is the fact that when he's giving you his personal history and answering questions, he seems rather disengaged and he does not seem cognitively sharp. So all the red flags are there, more workup is needed. We'll think about next steps. And with that, of course, I think it's useful to think about what are the available screening measures or what are the additional um, questions that need to be asked. So I'm lucky enough to have been part of a work group that put together this 3Ds uh, assessment guide. It's a pocket card that provides guidance um, and small little um, questionnaires and, and screens for these three disorders. Uh, the current version is actually from 2014 that I have the picture of here. We actually were incredibly hard at work and ready to put out the 2020 version last, oh, I don't know, April or March. I think you can imagine what happened with that. Suddenly it was a world of telehealth and nobody wanted a card, something tangible mailed to them. So we've been hard at work on it and now it's going to be the 2021 version. The real changes though that are being made are not the, the core content. We're mostly updating it um, to adjust to some of the VA rules um, for which brief tests they recommend the most. Also some updated recommendations for risk assessment in suicide or possible self-harm situations. So we have tons of these 2014 versions um, that are great versions and in fact have um, some I think some more practical instruments on them, but we'll also soon be having our 2021 version come out that will fit along with VA guidelines, especially um, of interest to you if you're in a VA setting. Uh, this is just sort of a flat panel view of what the card kind of looks like. Uh, if I have time, I'll come back and review all the pieces in more detail, but I want to keep moving along. The CAM, the confusion assessment method, is the uh, brief um, screen for delirium that I most highly recommend. Uh, the information is in here. You can look it up online. It's freely available. There's even a short version of it, which is what I find funny because it's really short already um, and very helpful. You want to use collateral sources of information as much as possible when working up delirium. Um, do think about the broad differential. Stephen Thielke doesn't love that I use this acronym, but I use the acronym I Watch Death to remind myself of which um, are the most common causes of delirium, and I sort of run through that checklist. So in this case for Joseph, that was one of the first things done, of course, was to make sure that there was no acute medical uh, problem going on, and he was negative for these um, known typical causes of delirium. So shifting gears here, depression certainly is a possibility for Joseph. He's lonely, he misses his wife, he's disengaged. Uh, I think that it's so important that people don't 
think that asking about mental health symptoms is only the domain of mental health professionals. It's really important that we, even if our friends or our neighbors are showing signs that, that we give them at least the opportunity to share if they want to. Uh, if you have tools at your disposal, you'll feel much more confident about asking these questions. And then also having some sort of a plan. If someone does sort of give you a positive, like, actually, I can't believe you asked me that. I have been um, taking my dad's gun out and, and loading it and unloading it. You want to have some response to that so that you're um, able to to give them that empathic support that they need while also helping them move toward um, assistance. So the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9, which I'm gonna show you in a moment, are free and common. And I think that they are particularly amenable to use from um, frontline staff, whether you're a nurse or a physician, social worker, anyone. Uh, the VA um, Veterans Health Administration has been shifting to using what's called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. I, I get torn because I, I, I absolutely support the VA mission of wanting to reduce suicides. Okay, it's a problem. It's a problem outside the VA, but particularly in the VA. I worry sometimes, though, that we're losing the asking about how someone feels and just trying to see if they're suicidal uh, and kind of jumping past that. However, if you have someone who is feeling down, you absolutely want to follow up with questions about suicide. So I've put the link here to the Columbia. I also, in your slides, you'll have this um, kind of the, the initial questions for the Columbia suicide screening. It's really a fantastic tool. Uh, and if you ask the first two questions and they're negative for both, both feelings in the past month and lifetime, um, you don't have to go on or one doesn't have to go on and do additional suicide workup. The thing is though, is that if you get a positive on these, you definitely need to move forward. If you don't get a positive, it doesn't mean that they don't have depression. So that's why I don't like it as a standalone only tool, which is why, again, I come back to the PHQ-2, it's uber quick, self-report screen. Over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by these problems? And the first one really gets at anhedonia, that loss of pleasure in day-to-day -day life. And then the second one is very straightforward, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Uh, if you get a score of three or greater, you should move on to the PHQ-9. And that's this next slide. More questions. The first two are repeated, of course. So it's only seven more questions. And it gets at these other symptoms that I showed you earlier. Um, I have in here sort of a suicide risk evaluation is recommended immediately if someone scores greater than a certain number. Please don't adhere too hard to these cutoffs. Um, definitely follow the cutoffs, but if you, your gut says that they may need more, even if they don't quite meet that marker, it's worth going forward and doing more. So for uh, Joseph, his workup was actually positive and he was referred for mental health treatment. And I am very pleased to say it was um, that it was, um, sorry, that, that this had mental health treatment has been integrated more and more into primary care settings. It reduces the stigmatization, first of all, and it also really reduces the ease of access for care. If you have either a, a mental health counselor, a psychologist, a social worker, someone who does um, mental health counseling care assessment in your clinic, and you can do that handoff, that warm handoff, it is so much more effective than giving them a, a card with a mental health clinic phone number on it and a crisis line. I'm not saying don't do that if that's what you have available, but consider how much of a connection, especially in depression and suicide, you can make for someone. Okay. Shifting gears here, thinking about frontline tools for dementia. Oh, sorry, I already said this, that Joseph's workup was positive. So he got engaged with care for mental health. Oh, but if you remember, I said that just, he's never had depression before in his life. So it is worthwhile to keep an eye on him and see how he responds to mental health treatment and whether there is um, anything else going on. So the red flags, the warning signs, whatever you want to call them um, of dementia are when there are signs and symptoms that a clinician or a caregiver or the patient themselves notices. And these are the things that should prompt some sort of an evaluation of cognition. No one is recommending that every adult over a certain age 
get a co brief cognitive test, right? Um, that is essentially silly um, when there's no markers for it. That would be like, I don't know, run, running any kind of a, an HIV test on every single individual that came into clinic or, uh, you know, trying to think of some other examples. It, what we want to do, though, is not miss the signs. And, and there's a, an, uh, items here that the clinicians may notice, um, patients or caregivers, things that they may report. I had that list of the things I hear in clinic earlier. Um, obviously, things like becoming lost in familiar places, not being able to follow directions. Those are pretty, or problems with self-care, nutrition, bathing, or safety. These are pretty um, those are, those are pretty notable markers. I think it's worthwhile to look for more subtle, subtle markers as well. Okay, let's see. I also think, um, I've had folks say to me, well, what's the point of catching dementia early? It's there's no treatments or cures for it. And my answer is, is that if we bring ourselves back to the four Ms, we remember that things like mobility, medications, and what matters, are critical. And if someone is having changes in mentation, the more that they have the chance to um, put out their feelings and their thoughts, what matters to them while they can is critical. It could be as simple as doing power of attorney for healthcare paperwork, um, trying to think about living situations where should their mobility decline as their thinking declines, they'll be well supported. So it's tricky though. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I do you know three to four occasionally in super complex cases, five hour evaluations that includes the interview where I'm collecting a whole bunch of test data in addition to my interview and, and, and really diving in deep to the different aspects of thinking and strengths and weaknesses for, for care planning and diagnosis. But in a non-specialist setting, how does one get some objective information on thinking ability? You're certainly not gonna do the tedious testing that I do. I do recommend things like the Minicog. Um, it's the quickest and you could argue it's a little bit dirty. It was developed by Sue Borson um, at the University of Washington. It's a screening tool um, and it does not diagnose dementia. It's only five possible points, um, but it, it can really catch if there's some change. You wanna get the patient's attention, say three words, ask them to say them and then remember them for later. Then you ask them to draw a clock and you've got pretty specific instructions that you give them step-by-step step if needed. Uh, and then you ask them what were the three words? Um, that they were supposed to remember. And there's this sort of a guideline here for scoring that zero to two is possible impairment, three to five suggests no impairment. I think that's a, that's a decent rubric. I would argue though, that if you get a grossly abnormal clock, um, which is only, um, sorry, I'm blinking, it's two points. So they would actually, if they got that really bad, did that really badly on that, they'd have three points total because they remembered all the words. I would argue that there still is impairment there, even though it falls in that three to five range. So I would follow up on that. And here's just a picture of a clock um, kind of um, emphasizing some of the different elements that are necessary for it. Oh, I would say really quickly though, the, the clock can be culturally insensitive for certain populations. So um, perhaps it's Native Americans, um, Native Alaskans, uh, there are a number of cultures for which that sense of time and frequency of, of using a clock or, or, or commenting on a clock, certainly drawing a clock, um, are, are either don't exist or infrequent. So this could be a bad test for folks like that. But there are many other brief cognitive measures there's the slums or the mocha. These are good examples of 30 point measures. They have more sensitivity and specificity than something like a mini cog. And they often take, I mean, if someone's cognitively normal, they'll take less than 10 minutes, maybe only like five to seven minutes to administer. And someone who's impaired, they can take a little bit longer, but I would just argue that you're getting really good data if you're working through it and getting a total score for them. So here's a picture of what the mocha looks like, what the slums look like. These are all very easily available on the internet. Um, in my line of work, people aren't trying to fake bad um, because that often means that they have delirium, dementia, or depression. Uh, so, but do be on the watch for that. Um, if someone scores perfectly, 
um, the flip side, sorry, that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't look it up online and rehearse for it. So if you, it's good to have more than one tool in your tool belt in case you get the sense that they seem familiar with it. I think since um, our, the president um, commented on or that some his the physician commented on his perfect MOCA score, um, I think uh, it's become something that people looked up a lot. I want to say a perfect score on this is nothing but a perfect score on a brief cognitive measure. Uh, folks that are highly educated and um, in certain categories, uh, highly intelligent, uh, a 30 score may not reflect areas of loss in thinking that they are experiencing. And similarly, someone who is lower education or has a little lower intellectual uh, function premorbidly uh, is in their whole life, they might score at a 20 out of 30 and that is, that's them. Uh, and so you wouldn't want to pathologize that for them and call it a dementia. There's also the blessed um, orientation and memory. Oh dear, now I forgot the acronym that exists. I, I have trouble with that one because it's sort of reverse scored. So I feel like it doesn't communicate well in, in medical notes, but that's available. It's been around for a long time. There's also a test called the Addenbrook that was actually developed in Australia, but they did create a US version of that. And that is freely available. Uh, the M-ACE is a shortened version of it, the modified ACE, or the ACE-3 is the newest version of it. And you can look that up online. I'm not necessarily endorsing any of these. Um, my favorite personally is the MOCA, which is why I have just a little bit more information here about the MOCA. It's way more sensitive than the mini mental status examination. It's very well researched. Um, they have a great website where you can uh, check all the references, the studies that have used it. It comes in multiple English versions, which is helpful if you're, say, working, you're a nurse on an inpatient unit and you're trying to track someone's resolving delirium or other aspects of thinking. It comes in other languages, which is helpful if you can speak that language or you have an interpreter who can speak that language, not so much if you don't speak it. And then these days, what's been critical in this past year is that they have a, a blind version, which also works as a telephone version. And then they also quickly made their visual stimuli available in PDF format so you can print or show it on a screen um, for a telemedicine version. The challenge with the MOCA is that the developers um, have felt, uh, at least this is a hearsay, have felt that it may be being used without people actually being adequately trained or even reading. The, I think it's like a two page uh, set of instructions for how to properly administer it um, and possibly um, over interpreting the results, giving people diagnoses when not enough workup has been done or it's not conclusive. So uh, they've had a training that they want people to do. It's about $150. There's a group rate to do it. Um, and so if that fits within your practice or your supervisors or whoever will pay for it, I think it's worthwhile. Um, it's one of the best measures in my opinion, because here I'm flashing back, it actually kind of stole <laughs> from some of my most sensitive measures. Um, sensitive and specific measures for trying to detect, detect dementia. It's not um, nearly as in-depth or exhaustive as, as what I do, but it does um, align with its increased sensitivity for detecting both dementia and mild cognitive impairment. So uh, as of February 1st, the training is expected there. Neuropsychologists don't have to do the training, but I find it funny because I don't I don't administer the MOCA. That's what I'm hoping the physician or nurses or social workers or psychologists will do before they refer to me. I have some slides at the end of the talk um, that refer specifically to the telephone and telemedicine versions of this in more detail. We'll see if we have time to get to that. I think what's more important is why would we want to use these brief cognitive tests? The answer is not to diagnose a cognitive disorder like dementia based on that score alone. It is, however, incredibly useful for getting some objective info. For instance, a quick sense of global function. Maybe this isn't a decline from their baseline, but maybe nobody's actually thought to look into why are they having so much trouble taking their medications. Maybe they have some cognitive weaknesses. So you can identify if there are some deficits, um, at least in the, in the moment. And also if someone has identified deficits, there's the ability to follow them over time. 
is there any reason to question whether the patient has decision-making capacity? I emphasize this when I give um, a version of this talk to psychiatry residents on inpatient units. Um, we do ECT and um, transmagnetic stimulation stimulation as a treatment for severe depression at the VA, people have to consent to that. It's a procedure and not without potential side effects or repercussions. And I get concerned sometimes that folks with a 12 out of 30 on a MOCA are giving consent. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that's happening. I'm saying I don't want to see that happening. So I always remind them that it's important to catch if someone has um, incredible or notably low cognition. I also think it can be useful to identify possible markers of cognitive decline early. Maybe it's someone who truly has early Alzheimer's disease um, based on the rest of the workup, and that might allow you to do early introduction of a cholinesterase inhibitor, which doesn't cure the Alzheimer's, but could help them maintain some of the function they have for longer. Maybe it's useful for addressing any reversible influences. I've had folks who um, had sleep apnea and were really resistant to treatment and they had testing and we showed that they had areas of weakness and they used their CPAP regularly for six months. And what do you know? Some of their thinking was actually improved at the end of that time. It can assist with care planning. And then, well, I kind of just said this, motivating patients towards positive behavioral change. Um, there's so many different ways that that can occur. Maybe maybe the, the, the MOCA or the slums or whatever it is um, shows that they don't have any obvious cognitive deficits, but you can then talk to them about how they have these risk factors for decline and perhaps quitting smoking or starting some sort of a walking or exercise routine would be useful. All right, so I've gone on and on a bit about these warning signs and ways to screen cognition. What was that other really important piece um, of the puzzle for dementia diagnosis or its consideration? What's left? It's function. So we cannot forget about function. Um, oh dear, I'm sorry, I actually said that too soon. So really quickly though, for the cognitive screening, we wanna think about the meaning. Um, who, how do we interpret it? Who are the appropriate populations? Um, I mentioned if someone has low education, maybe lifelong learning disabilities, they may score lower. If someone has hearing or vision problems, that can impact their score, limited hand function. It's really poor as standalone measures. Um, I really recommend having collateral input and thinking about the other risk factors and context. Okay, so Joseph um, was given a MOCA at the clinic, um, the primary care clinic, and his score was 25. It's in that gray zone. It's not a number you can say, oh yeah, no big deal, go home, you're fine, everything's normal. It's also not terribly uh, alarming. So this is where I meant to say, we've got to remember the other piece of the puzzle and that is functional activities. Um, here's, and this is on our, um, our uh, 3Ds card, but you can look these up. There's so many different scales for assessment of functional activities. Uh, that might be changing uh, if someone is in earliest stages of dementia. I do recommend having one that you is your go-to method. Um, you can see here, the one I use most often is primarily focused on what are called complex uh, uh, activities of daily living, independent uh, daily living, because um, people are usually coming to me at the earliest stages of change rather than um, when basic activities like bathing and, um, and self-care are declining. So uh, Joseph was um, not, a, he, he was intact on all of these. He didn't always keep up on everything with housekeeping because he didn't really care about it, um, but that's different than not being able to. So we just want to always remember that dementia is that diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, and then, you know, we, we've got to think about how to motivate our patients toward positive change, whether that's management of medical conditions or behavioral factors that they may have um, some control over. I am going to take one short pause here and see if um, my husband can come get the puppy from my office because <laughs> he seems to be waking up. One second. Very awkward uh, segue in the middle of a talk. Okay, so in thinking about, um, we can put this in both a positive light or a negative light. The negative light is, is if you don't take care of these things or do this, you are more likely to get dementia. 
I really, I try, it's hard, but I really always try to put it from the more positive direction, which is here are the things that are associated with healthy brain aging. And these are things that are associated with healthy brain aging, regardless of whether your cognition is typical for age. Um, and so it doesn't really matter whether someone has mild cognitive impairment, early dementia, or none of that, uh, for whether we would recommend that they take good care of their blood pressure, cholesterol, their diabetes, treat sleep apnea, right? Um, and, and really think about what behavioral factors they're engaging in or not engaging in that can have effect on thinking. Uh, let's see. And this is where that, I'll just argue, comes right back to that, what matters most. I can tell someone, you should treat your sleep apnea. But if I don't know what's important to that person and what the treatment of their sleep apnea may actually enable them to do more during the day that matters to them, I haven't really much of a shot of, an, uh, of encouraging change. So for instance, if someone talks about how they don't have energy to get together with their grandson and go fishing, or they fell asleep during their favorite news program the day before, I would talk about how treatment of sleep apnea could possibly allow them to engage in those things uh, better and more completely. So for the three Ds, this is kind of just a little action plan and it's to rule out as step one, always think about potentially treatable causes of cognitive change, uh, monitor people, and in many cases, more in-depth evaluation may be necessary. That could be um, seeing a specialist, uh, like a neuropsychologist like me, it could be just ordering more labs, um, more than just the basic panel that you've got, uh, perhaps a brain scan. I said brain scan just sort of generically, I think um, if you're concerned about dementia, an MRI versus a CT is recommended. CTs are great at picking up on more acute uh, change or um, you know, uh, insults to the brain. MRIs can be ordered with certain sequences that can highlight um, indicators of cerebrovascular disease, also have the um, resolution to look at particular regions of the brain, especially the medial temporal lobes, where the hippocampi are that are so affected early in, uh, say, Alzheimer's disease. So I do find that an MRI is more useful. So this is that suggested action plan. Let's see. And even if you do catch something right in that step one rule out, keep your eyes out for the, uh, keep your eyes on the other three, uh, the other two, as they um, may be very possibly going on as well. Okay, back to Joseph. Let's see, this is just that sort of um, rehash of what we talked about before. And so I think I mentioned delirium was ruled out. Depression treatment was initiated. But I would argue that dementia is to be determined. That 25 on the MOCA wouldn't have me, if I was um, working in a primary care clinic, it wouldn't have me running for a full neuropsychological evaluation. Um, I mean, it depends a little bit how concerned they are and maybe there's hints of impact on daily living. Um, or especially if the depression treatment helps his mood, but he's still scoring um, where he is on a MOCA, I would then probably um, send him for more testing. So we can see how this is not always something that can be, all, it can't all always be figured out right in a short frame of time. Okay, so I didn't wanna ignore uh, current events, although I gotta tell you a pandemic, it doesn't seem like just a current event because it's been going on for so long. Um, COVID-19 considerations in care with 3Ds. The very first article I spotted was early April. It didn't take long um, before there were people identifying delirium in a subset, a subset of patients who are hospitalized um, or coming in for care, sorry. I think it's important to remember that older adults and those with pre-existing specific conditions, especially pre-existing cognitive conditions are more susceptible. So this is um, from September, a very solid article in the Lancet Neurology. Um, and this emphasized the risk of delirium again. And here they're using the term encephalopathy for delirium. That's what neuro neurologists like to do. I think I mentioned that the clinic I trained in, you like to say metabolic encephalopathy, wait, toxic metabolic encephalopathy. 
Uh, note also though that uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and acute cerebrovascular disease were seen at a higher rate. Um, acute cerebrovascular disease, uh, sort of in lay terms, we call it just called stroke. Um, and so those are things that are just being noticed acutely. I think it's going to be interesting, um, hopefully interesting in a good way, as in not too many things that um, in the year or years to come, hopefully there won't be a lot more of findings here. Um, I would say that sort of the skinny on the three Ds for COVID-19 is that there's absolutely, it's completely unknown what its effect will be on the development um, and incidence of dementia. There could be an uptick in dementia, um, which would not be surprising given the uh, notable inflammatory and pulmonary effects of COVID-19. Depression, well, that's happening right now, uh, a major effect. The isolation and social distancing um, are, are really, really tricky. Um, and then also consider the fact that there could be survival, survivor guilt among those with COVID who recover. Um, hey, sorry, my six-year-old has just popped in. Archie, I am on a live talk. Could you go talk to daddy? Thank you. No, 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 you go talk to him, okay? He's in charge. Go now. Come on, buddy. Mommy. You cannot. Go talk to your father. Okay, sorry, everyone. Real life right here in the now. Um, so the depression is a very important consideration and we can do a lot to support um, our patients who are, are dealing with this. Um, sometimes it's really hard to get people to reach out and identify who, their who is in their community that they can find ways to have contact with. So trying to help with that is important. Uh, there may be, psycho I mentioned the psychosocial changes. Uh, there are any losses uh, among, possibly among their friends, um, family members. There also end up, may end up being associated physical and functional losses. So that's uh, high on the list of concerns. I think you've already heard me say delirium is definitely an increased risk. This is being pretty consistently found. Um, how late, how long that susceptibility will be there, I don't know. So I've stolen this from Gary Larson. It's a far side cartoon of Superman in his later years. And he he's a little bit older and he's, he's at the edge of a windowsill. It appears to be a high building and he's turned back to Lois and he's like, dang, now where was I going? So here I am trying to end with a little bit of levity. Um, I want you to realize that, does this mean he has dementia? Mm, we don't know that. Does it mean he's delirious? It could be. Uh, is he depressed? That could even be a possibility as well. Uh, but hopefully at this stage, you've uh, heard some information, learned about some tools so that you might feel a little bit better um, about using these to identify and especially to initiate treatment um, for anyone that has the, the positives on the screens. So thank you very much. It looks like I'm running at about 72 minutes, which means that I have enough time for questions. And we've fantastic. got quite a few of them. So. Oh, I do. All right. Yeah, great. You great. okay for me to start here? I am. I am going to quickly close the door that my six-year-old left open, though. So hopefully that will deter. <laughs> So Chris has um, mentioned the high incidence of comorbidity of delirium and dementia. You talked about that earlier in your talk. Um, and what are the risk factors since delirium is preventable and treatable? What can we do to educate and prevent? Um, Chris is thinking that medical man uh, medication management, dehydration, et cetera, are likely culprits for this comorbidity. Yes, you know, and I really, I should really add dehydration um, in there. I, I think um, polypharmacy, there's often these cases where just one little medication is added and it's one that on its own has so few side effects, but it's the tipping point for someone's essentially their, their metabolic system. Or, um, you know, you, you have the flu and you get dehydrated and then your body has this reaction. And, and especially if someone's cognitively vulnerable, they can become delirious. I, I think it's really, really hard given how many things that can cause delirium to um, be on top of them all, all the time. I wish we could get a little bit more education out to the public 
about delirium, um, but perhaps we're, we're starting here with the most important people, um, or at least the, 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 the primary people who can then share this information. I actually tell people, if I get someone in who's maybe had a past UTI and I'm diagnosing them with early stage dementia, I actually highlight the fact that, hey, I noticed you've had a UTI in the past. Um, you should know that with your memory loss, you may have trouble keeping track of your symptoms. So for instance, someone, you know, if you wake up one morning and there's just a, sorry, I'm gonna be a TMI here, but you're a little, a little bit of burning upon urination, you might think, Ugh, you know, I'm not gonna call my doctor today, but if it's worse tomorrow, then I'll call. But if you wake up tomorrow and you think, oh, a little bit of burning, but you don't remember that you also had that yesterday, it's not gonna trigger that call in the earliest stages, but at earlier stages it might have previously. And this goes a lot for caregivers as well. They just kind of, I, I hate to put anything more on a caregiver's plate, um, but being a little bit more observant for things like somnolence, agitation that wasn't there before, um, rashes, you know, if someone gets a cut, you kind of really have to check and make sure it's healing properly, even though that person might not like you asking them to show them, you know, their, their, their cut um, until it's fully healed. So um, monitoring medications, obviously taking too many of a medication um, or under treating a condition can cause delirium. I, there's, I, I really recommend going to some of the source material. Delirium itself, I, I feel inadequate to cover it as one of three things in this talk. It could be three talks on its own. <laughs> um, so if anyone's really interested, please reach out to me. I actually even know of a couple talks available online um, that are very specific to delirium. Great. Um, what do you do to a person who obviously is having depression sy symptoms, but refuse to go to a doctor or any healthcare provider? Um, this person says he's okay and lives alone. Thoughts about strategy? Oh, it hurts my heart. <laughs> When, when folks are in that position. Um, well, this is a couple things come to mind. I, in my experience, this is again, what matters most. And it all depends on what your relationship is with them and what context you interact with them. But I have found that people are willing to go talk to a pastor or a spiritual leader um, that, and they wouldn't go to a, you know, one of those quacks, you know, whatever sort of fun term they have for psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, I do want to make sure that they get um, evidence-based treatment and, and guidance. On the other hand, sometimes just having someone to talk to. Um, and so I, if, if they have a, a connection with a spiritual community, I would go for that. I'm trying to think what are some of the other options. Um, you know, even just sometimes like one of those, like if it's a better, uh, there's the 1-800-TALK that is for, there's a specific um, option for veterans, but it's just an overall national line. Uh, it doesn't have to be if someone's suicidal. So even putting a card like that somewhere where they might find it, um, that has the number, you could just at least feel like you're trying to do something. Um, oh, interesting. So Catherine said there is reactive depression also as opposed to organic depression. And the etiology of each is very different. Any um, additional comments about that? Um, um, I might be um, not thinking of the terms quite the same way that person is. In my mind, the reactive depression is kind of is typically more that reaction to grief or loss or medical illness, um, a, a situational um, depression. I mean, I've certainly had feelings of depression during this pandemic, um, and I don't think that I am having, you know, serotonin changes in my brain, or at least that that wasn't the origin of the feelings. Um, I would argue that it's, it's a reactive depression. Um, on the other hand, there are people who, who sort of as their, their brain's homeostasis are low in certain neurotransmitters. Um, dopamine or, or, or serotonin. Um, and so those organic causes, um, that's sort of what I typically think of as an organic cause or say in a dementia or other brain disease, Parkinson's disease 
very frequently has dementia, I mean, sorry, depression associated with it. Um, that's both to the changes they're going through, sort of a reactive depression, but also due to the organic changes and declines in dopamine production. Uh, the interesting thing is, is I have not seen anything conclusive to suggest that that does that that would change your approach uh, dramatically to treatment, um, especially in consideration of doing sort of a combo therapy um, or you know picking one or the other uh, for that person. It should still have some potential effectiveness. Well, and then somebody asks, um, what about adding grief to the three Ds? Three Ds. Uh, <laughs> yes, I. I think that grief is very real, but grief is a, an adjustment process. It is a psychological state, but it is one, I'm not saying anyone gets all the way through it or that if you have some significant loss that, oh, it's all better someday. But there's been so much study of the stages of grief and coming to terms with grief and being able to eventually enjoy life again and, and um, not ruminate on the loss. And, and so that's a normal um, reaction and progression. I, oh, sorry, I don't like saying normal, um, but a typical, uh, just like trauma. Sorry, I'll take a moment to think about my work with older veterans who um, have post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, a huge percentage of our population, and especially those that serve in the military, experience a trauma in their lifetime. Not the, it is not the case that the majority of people develop PTSD from that trauma. So I guess you could argue that grief is something that almost everyone experiences, but not everyone ends up in a deep depression that does not um, resolve on its own from that. Just like from trauma, most people um, are able, they're, they're able to work through it, go through stages. Again, it doesn't erase what happened. Um, but they don't necessarily develop more of, say, a, uh, a chronic syndrome. Although this the person interventions out, are different. I was going to say this person points out that we may see um, more grief reactions um, during the time of the pandemic if pe as people have lost close family, friends, and... Um, uh, yes. I would argue that the overall level of grief being experienced by all and disproportionately by many is incredible um, and in the world, but you know what, we end up being a little centrist and focused on the United States. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a very real thing. Um, and there's traumas that are occurring too during this time. Um, so being on the lookout for the development of um, uh, more of a depressive syndrome or post-traumatic stress disorder, things like that will be important in healthcare settings. So um, Carolyn is wondering actually, how does early life trauma like abuse and exploitation play into depression and dementia in older adults? Oh, that's a great question. I, I don't, um, I don't think that I could hold myself up as an expert in terms of like depression and for, for that um, line of development. In dementia, it's, it's often challenging because many people develop resilience and, and they have life achievements that they achieve and, and have to reflect on that help support them when those traumas or, or those experiences kind of refresh in their mind. Unfortunately, when someone develops dementia, those more recent achievements and positive affirmations, may their ability to recollect those may be decreased. And, and thus there's sometimes a problem where uh, the unfortunate situation where people are living more in the past and the past might've been bad. Um, I see this with veterans a lot who um, have traumatic experiences, say, from during Vietnam, who are now developing dementia. One, I look out for folks who had PTSD, have had PTSD pretty much chronically, but um, for whom these symptoms are really cropping back up again. They're having nightmares again. They're having, um, and they find themselves thinking about those days um, all the time now. Um, and yet they can't, they're, they're not sure who is the current president or well, we could all be unsure about that with all the confusion. Um, but you know what I'm trying to say, like they, they may not remember that, um, you know, what movie they saw last weekend. 
So Jim is wondering about cognitive testing with highly anxious patients. Do you have any tips? Uh, so that is hard to get past on something like one of those, those brief cognitive tests. Um, I, I have the luxury, uh, if I can get someone in the door <laughs> for a neuropsychological evaluation, I don't want to jinx myself, but I have an incredibly high hit rate of getting folks through the full evaluation. Um, I think a lot of times it's important to not ignore the anxiety or try to push through, but maybe try to get at, well, what is it that it seems like you're a little anxious or I, I, I wonder if you're giving up a little quickly. Is there something that you're concerned about with what we're doing? Because we don't have to do this, right? Um, and so I often, I emphasize that this is not a diagnostic test. This is not, um, a lot of times people will say, well, this is gonna tell you if I'm cuckoo, right? That's lay language, that's not my language, right? Um, and so talking to them about the limits of what we get from it, but also the benefits, um, yeah, I think in terms of like the brief cognitive test, I would say more about, well, you've told me that you feel like your memory is not as good as it used to be. Or maybe maybe your wife is really worried about your thinking abilities. Um, you know, let's do this. If you're willing to do it, it'll answer some questions. Of course, if you do really well, it doesn't mean you'll be in the clear for the rest of your life. Um, and if you do poorly, it doesn't necessarily mean you have dementia, but we would probably want to do more work up. Um, Sometimes people are worried that you're gonna yank their car keys or things like that. So trying to address those things um, versus just sort of scoot past them, I think usually works best. So Emily, we're at 5.30, but I'm wondering if you have a few more minutes to get to a couple more questions. Is that? I, I do, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, someone was asking about um, the impact of um, many medications that can affect cognitive functioning. Um, and just was wondering um, if you wanted to add anything more about the um, Beers criteria and these diagnoses of depression, dementia, and delirium. I can add a little bit. I want to be careful here. Um, there is no better friend in this topic than your pharmacist. Um, but I would say the Beers criteria are important. I refer to them frequently. For me, as someone who is um, most focused on cognition, I really am hyper-focused on those that um, affect acetylcholine, uh, which is a transmitter that is necessary for um, proper antrograde memory function, the ability to learn new information and retain it. I do think, though, that um, I can't say enough about wanting to avoid sedating medications, um, anxiolytics, a lot of them, uh, like benzodiazepines are, are, are really bad in older adults. And I know that sounds it's so just a, a blanket statement. Um, and it's really tough if you get someone who has actually lifelong, it's not uncommon that I get someone that has taken a benzo in the morning and at night for like the last 30 years. Um, and that's how they've managed their anxiety. On the other hand, they've often never engaged in therapy for their anxiety or tried um, a skills development to manage their anxiety. So I, I, whatever I can, I think about behavioral intervention, motivational interviewing. And sometimes it's not, I wanna take away your benzos. Sometimes it's, well, what if we could reduce your dosage? What if you only needed, you know, one pill a day? And I think that's a lot of the approach to opioids and, and other um, deleterious medications is that trying to take away everything from someone right away um, rarely is successful. And so um, reducing polypharmacy, reducing dosages of the concerning medications, obviously, sorry, this should be without, um, at, at any point when you're working with an older adult, frankly, anyone, but especially with older adults, the addition of a new medication needs to be done very thoughtfully. But so much emphasis now is on deprescribing. So that's probably why I focused on that first, um, is the trying to get rid of these medications that we know do and or can have um, negative effects on thinking or mood. Um, any sort of a brief um, comment um, about standards for assessment um, for primary care providers when they're seeing their um, older patients um, in terms of doing screenings? 
Um, I mean, I'm so biased as a geriatric neuropsychologist. I these syndromes are so common um, that I I would be on the lookout for them with everybody that comes in the door. Um, now, am I going to give the cam to everyone? No. Would I give um, a mocha to everyone? No. Nobody has time for that. <laughs> um, but I, I do think I would probably, um, a, a light screen for mood probably ought to absolutely be part of every interaction, maybe particularly now, given what's going on in our world and, and health. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not maybe sure how to answer that. I, I think that most Profession, health profession disciplines have some statements, kind of their their standards of practice that are probably what you should look to and follow. Um, I don't want to provide conflicting uh, <laughs> suggestions. I, okay, I'm well, super we can move I think on. all of these are important. And should always be asked about. <laughs> so um, Megan is wondering. Um, it's an interesting dilemma uh, if you have any comments about an assessor who is giving hints during the MOCA, for example, when they're given three words and after five minutes asked to repeat, but giving them hints. Seems like um, to her it's this so happens painful. all the time. It's so bad. It's not necessary. <laughs> well, um, it can, she mentions that it can impact you know, um, eligibility for services sometimes too. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who sees a lot of gray in the world. I'm not normally a black and white sort of, you know, good, bad kind of person. There are a few situations though, where I think that well-meaning people cause more harm than good. Um, and this would fall under that category. The measures, the tests are meant to be administered a certain way doesn't mean you have to give them like a jerk. Um, you can give, you know, you can be encouraging without giving comment on how they're doing. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not really doing your treatment planning a service and you're very likely undermining um, what's really going on for them and what they really need um, by helping them out or, or providing a connection that, that is not deserved. There's somebody else who might, well, I'll stop there. <laughs> so here's a question about the COVID segment. Um, is the, uh, do you know, is there an average duration of time for hospital related delirium with COVID versus non-COVID hospitalization? Perhaps COVID family visiting restrictions are deleterious? Wow. Um, well, COVID family visiting restrictions are in some ways very deleterious and in other ways all about um, prevention of spread and, 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 and there's a reason they're in place and, and as painful as they are for families, I, I support the um, attempts to reduce transmission. Um, I don't know, I, I haven't seen anything that's specifically commented on length of hospital stay. Everything I've been reading is so focused on the primary symptoms or, or what are referred to as the primary symptoms of COVID for the reasons why people tend to stay hospitalized. It's usually, you know, um, a breathing um, difficulty. Uh, so that's really, I'm, now I might have to go research. I may have to go look for that. Um, I haven't seen anything yet. Okay, Cheryl is wondering about, have you used the delirium acronym um, um, and is it helpful in the hospital to help identify delirium or is it more um, out in primary care, I guess? I kind of use it everywhere. I think I actually first heard it when I was in grad school and I was um, doing my neuroanatomy class with med students. It was their acronym that they used. Med students are notoriously morbid and, and have dark humor um, for as they're trying to memorize tons and tons of information. So um, it just stuck with me. I, I think um, what there are other acronyms out there. It's easy to look them up on the internet. I'm also happy. Email me. I'll provide you with some of the less morbid ones. I just like I watch death because we're trying to prevent death. <laughs> um, and and you know having dementia is not um, is is as tragic and challenging as it is. It is not something that would immediately rob someone of their ability to be with their families and possibly kill them within a week. 
um, delirium can do that. Um, so I, yeah, so I, I guess uh, that's kind of why I use that one. And um, have you seen any differences um, in later life? This is a completely different topic, but have you seen any differences in la later life sequelae from impact concussion versus blast concussion? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming maybe thinking about the vets. Yeah, so, so um, different types of traumatic brain injury do seem to be associated with some different physiological changes in the brain. I am not a, a traumatic brain injury, a TBI expert. I, I refer to my colleagues in this area. Uh, we have a number of fantastic researchers um, in, in this region. And the, and the VA is doing a lot of research on blast exposure. The, the waves that occur with the blast are different than say a blunt force trauma. They're frankly different than the repetitive mild TBIs that we're usually talking about, say, for, for professional football players or not professional football players. So these all have incredibly different mechanics um, of, of action and their effect on the brain. It's, it's complicated. I, I, though I would emphasize that for folks with a, a mild traumatic brain injury, the vast majority of the research shows improve, they're, they're back to normal. Um, and in that percentage where the symptoms seem to persist or worsen even, um, a lot of times if they're identified, if they're um, worked up further, some PTSD is identified um, and perhaps some other um, uh, more treatment amenable conditions. Maybe sleep is disrupted and, and getting sleep treatment going better is, is will help with their sense of cognitive, cognitive impairment, things like that. So just two more quick questions. Um, Rose mentions that it almost sounds like the amygdala goes in overdrive among war vets. Is that far-fetched way of thinking about things? Um, that's interesting. So I don't think it's far-fetched. Um, there's definitely um, a, a really critical role of the amygdala um, in the immediate occurrence of trauma and then especially in its connections with the hippocampus in the cognitive processing of that trauma um, in the short term after it's experienced. Uh, that's why a lot of the research for PTSD these days, um, or I should say about prevention of PTSD is what can be done to improve the, the processing of the information and the emotional tagging that occurs with it based on amygdala reactions, uh, not reactions, I'm not acting like it's a person, but uh, in terms of that um, communication between that fear region of the brain, it is involved in much other, many other aspects of emotional processing, but it is really tightly linked to the hippocampus. I mean, that's evolutionary and for survival. Um, is it, as a biological organism, if a situation was dangerous and you feared for your life, it is critical that your brain process that memory and register where, where it was, what it was like, and never to go there again. Um, as quote unquote rational intellectual humans, we typically can work through that and learn that, oh, well, not every, you know, a, a gunshot is often just a hunter out in the woods. It's not someone trying to kill me or a helicopter going overhead while it at one point was dangerous is actually just the news crew off to investigate something. Um, but not everyone's brains kind of process through it in the moment or in the near term. Or, you know, and also frankly, sorry, I'll just comment that unfortunately when people are recovering from trauma, if they end up in a situation where they um, experience more trauma uh, that can unfortunately really derail and, and perhaps you could argue cement some of the negative associations that are made. Oh, I'm really getting off. Uh, <laughs> well, here's, we're going to so go. I've always been, I've been fascinated by PTSD and cognition since um, I started at the VA 12 years ago. Um, so we're going to conclude with a, with a more screening-based question. And Linda is wondering about the PHQ-2 versus the PHQ-9, as well as the CATS or the Lawton for IADL assessment related, I think, probably to the functioning aspect of um, these. Um, 
So the PHQ2 and the PHQ9 are really the same instrument. It's just that you only have to give the, the, the argument is that you only have to give the first two questions if they don't um, endorse hopelessness or a loss of pleasure in sort of day, daily life. Um, the PHQ9 is really just the name for the full instrument and that you would ask all nine of the questions if you're getting a hint that there could be some depression. Um, I think it's a pretty nice instrument. Um, as a mental health professional, it would be insufficient. Um, if I'm doing um, an intake evaluation, I've got to do a lot more. I've got to ask about, you know, lifetime um, depression, lifetime preparatory behaviors for self-harm or harm to others. There's, there's so much more. Um, thinking about the IEDLs, the instrumental activities of daily living or basic activities of daily living, I don't really have a total favorite for that one. I put the FAQ in this talk because I think it's um, it's pretty crisp. It's short. Um, there's, I think, if I'm going to get them mixed up, the Lawton is uh, a little longer questionnaire. Um, and so depending on your setting, if you have time to query more, I think what's really challenging is when we are trying to question function, query functional activities in someone who, say, the stuff we're asking, they don't, they don't work anymore, they're retired. And since they retired, they kind of don't do anything. And maybe they still have a partner who's, say, doing all the household stuff and the cooking and, and they don't manage the day-to-day -day finances. And, and you end up with only like, well, how's your driving? And pretty much everybody says, oh, it's great. <laughs> um, or as to say, a lot of people, even if they're not driving well, are, are, they don't want to lose driving. They, they see that as a risk. Um, so it, it can get tricky to ask about those things. Um, I'm always you know, impressed I if I learn that... Oh, sorry. Mentioning them um, uh, in relation to the question about some standards of care that those might be um, useful, and she agrees that the Lawton is probably longer than the cat. Yeah, I, I I think a lot of neuropsychologists use it. Um, I, I personally, you know, one of the things I like to ask about, and this isn't getting at functional activities, but say I'm I'm running into a brick wall on that, um, or they won't do the mocha. <laughs> they don't want to do. Yeah, you know, say someone doesn't want to engage in full testing. Um, I well, actually, I just do it at the end of my interview, like it's no big deal. I ask about current events. Um, if things are particular, like I can tell that like they have really strident politics, especially if I may not want to hear about them. Maybe I ask about the Seahawks, you know, and, and it's really informative. If they can tell me um, about the embarrassing loss from this past weekend to the Rams and, and blah, 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 blah. Well, I'll tell you right now, they're not having severe challenges with laying down new memories. Um, so there's just ways to try to get at thinking abilities and day-to-day -day function without, you got to try to get at it casually sometimes. Um, I'm not saying tricking people, but more just um, meet them where they are. What, what do they do? What's of interest to them? Uh, I'm trying to think of other things. Well, yeah, I, 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 um, we're now at um, 5.45, so I, I think... Um... <laughs> think we should give you a break. <laughs> no, we should wrap up. I've got Archie's come back into the room. I've got it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. And the chat is filled with people um, saying how invaluable this talk was and that your handout was um, really informative. So thanks so much, Dr. Trichu. Great. Thank you all for attending and for your attention. I really appreciate it. Wonderful questions. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you next week, everyone. Ha, 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 ha.